introduce uh, Professor Linford. He is one of the United Kingdom's leading uh, macroeconomists, and he holds the chair of Applied Economics at, at uh, Cardiff University. Uh, he has the distinction of being regarded as Margaret Thatcher's favorite economist. Uh, and uh, I believe that our current Prime Minister is a bit partial to him too. So uh, I, I'm sure you're looking forward to hearing what he has to say, particularly about the Centre for Brexit Policy uh, paper, delivering a new growth strategy uh, for Britain's economy, uh, which was co-authored by uh, Patrick, together with uh, Warwick Lightfoot and Edgar Miller. And I'm sure that you'll want to say a bit about the recommendations of that paper. So could I ask you to give him a warm welcome, Professor Lynch. Thank you very much, David. And apologies, everybody, that it's just me. <laughs> um, but I'll try and keep you entertained. If you... <laughs> well, um, I'll try and keep you entertained with economics, if that's not an oxymoron, I think it is. <laughs> <laughs> but until, until help arrives. Um, thank you very much, David, for that introduction. And yes, um, uh, I want to talk about the, the, the kind of arguments that we put forward in that report for the Centre for Brexit Policy about what we saw as the necessary reforms in the direction of policy. I mean, we, we wrote it at a time when uh, the proposal from this government was to raise taxes on business from uh, corporation tax from, from 19 to 25% and had, had already raised taxes on labor quite substantially. And um, we, we felt that this was a real, uh, a, ter a terrible mistake. And at the same time, policy was very restrictive in terms of what the government was doing to the economy in terms of demand. And so it was it was creating through this a huge recessionary prospect, which of course the Bank of England then reflected in its reports on what was happening to the economy. If you look at the last Bank of England report, they, they forecast a very ugly recession going forward. And of course that fed into their deliberations in the form of great reluctance to raise rates, and as in the end they raised them by 0.5%, as we know. Um, and uh, that was too little, and certainly a lot less than what other central banks around the world were doing. The Fed was raising them by 0.75% in a series of kind of big adjustments. And even the European Central Bank, which has had, had negative rates until very recently, was starting to raise them quite sharply because they were very alarmed by the inflation situation. And um, so the background against which we wrote this report was kind of made us um, very aware that things were going pretty badly wrong. And so what we talked about was what should be the principle on, on which government fiscal policy, that's tax and spending policy, both sides of the coin, should be based. And what we found was that, of course, what was being done was nothing at all. Taxes were being raised because of fiscal rules, short-term fiscal rules, which said you must balance the budget over such and such a, a year or a couple of years or three years because otherwise you would be traducing the solvency prospects of the government. But this was a complete misunderstanding in our view, and we tried to explain this, of what solvency means and what a government does in order to be solvent. A government has um, a budget which is subject to what's known as a budget constraint, which means that it's got, if it, spends more than it taxes and um, spends more in either interest or direct public services, more than it taxes, it, it, has, it has to borrow, of course. But that um, is a constraint which says how much you have to borrow in order to meet your current situation. It doesn't say you shouldn't borrow. 
solvency means that in the long run, you, you must be able to finance your spending long term with your tax, including all the interest on your borrowings. And that's what it means. In fact, the technical condition is that the rate of growth of your debt has got to be less than the real rate of interest. And that's not a very meaningful remark. Um, it's, it just happens to be a mathematical condition for, for solvency for an infinitely lived government. But it's very different from what the government was doing, which were these fiscal rules which said, you shouldn't borrow fundamentally, or if you should, only for a very short time. And um, so the, what, what had happened was that we borrowed, obviously, hugely during the COVID uh, episode, because that was like a war. And everyone understands you've got to borrow in wars and really bad situations of crisis. But when that was over, the Treasury and all this sort of conventional wisdom reverted back to the idea, oh gosh, we borrowed now this huge amount for COVID. Therefore, we must go back to balancing our spending against our revenues in the short run. Again, these very short-term fiscal rules. And that meant that we put up taxes and we, we pursued one of the tightest fiscal policies in the OECD. And even the OECD, which is part of the conventional wisdom, was saying, do you really have to have such a very tight fiscal policy that's going to dampen growth in the economy, drive growth down in the economy, when you're, when you're going into a sort of era of quite tight money? <coughs> the answer to that was clearly not. No. So the way to, the, the common sense practical implication of that solvency condition I talked about is simply that over the long run, the debt to GDP ratio should be trending downwards to a sustainable level in the longer run, like say 10 years ahead. Um, and if you satisfy that condition, you can be pretty sure you're solvent. And if you look at the history of British borrowing over two centuries, on two occasions of which we had a debt to GDP ratio of nearly 300%, once after fighting Napoleon, um, and once after fighting Hitler, and um, on both occasions, we have this humongous debt to GDP ratio, nearly 300%, as I say. And did we suddenly go into a funk and say we had to have short run fiscal rules and we must you know, raise taxes to the roof and stop spending money? No, of course we didn't. We, we followed sensible policies, knowing that we would, in the long run, get those debt ratios done. Of course, we did. It took, it took quite a long time, and we took our time over it through growth and through inflation, that, that debt to GDP ratio through the rise in nominal GDP. That, on both those occasions, the debt to GDP ratio came down over a fairly long period of time to a sort of 50% sort of normally safe level. And that's what common sense says you should do about solvency. And, it, and then, once you put that into place, what is the objective of government policy? You can see we were trying to get back to first principles here. The objective of government policy is clearly to maximize the welfare of the British people by all the means at their disposal, which includes regulation, it includes tax, it includes monetary policy. And so how do you do that? Well, clearly, you put down the best maximizing Maximizing the welfare of the British people means maximizing their living standard, which means maximizing growth. And so you get to what Kwasi Kwarteng kept on saying in his budget, that we're going to maximize growth. And of course, that's exactly should be the object of government policy. And then the rest is how do you do it? And how do you finance it? And of course, when you when you think about growth, we know there's been lots of research on growth, and we've done quite a bit ourselves, and got a model of the British economy, a growth model of the British economy, which you know we've tested against the, the British data and kind of fits it pretty well by the sort of pretty powerful tests we have these days. Um, 
And what does it say? It says, it says that growth comes from the incentives of entrepreneurs to create innovation, and that's what creates productivity growth. And they also need support, and, and in order to maximize the incentives of entrepreneurs, you need to keep taxes on them pretty low, of course. And you need to have regulations on them that are pro-business and don't get in their way. All of which is kind of, I think, pretty much common sense, and which what the sort of things that Mrs. Satcher used to say a lot, and, uh, and, 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 and she actually implemented a lot of this, these things. Towards the end of the 80s, she, she brought in a lot of these things that actually played to that objective. And so you've got tax, you've got tax must be kept low, um, you've got regulation must be kept simple and easy, particularly for small business to deal with. Um, we don't want a great compliance industry across all our, all our industries, because that's what we've got these days, isn't it? So, um, those two things, and, and then we've got, um, uh, we, we've got to have, um, we've got to have um, a situation where public spending also supports um, the economy. I mean, people, there's a lot of work in growth that highlights the importance of critical public services. And so, sort of simple-minded austerity, which is where you just clobber your public services, is very bad for growth. You know, things like education, um, infrastructure, um, police, law and order, the courts, backing up the common law, are all vital functions that the state performs in making industry able to be profitable and to be able to rely on the institutions of the economy. And when we know that growth comes from good institutions, low taxes, and good regulation. So, so then we should implement those policies and, and as far as the tax bit of it goes and the public spending bit of it goes, they should be disciplined not by stupid short-run fiscal rules, but by long-run solvency principles. You, the, the government should be running projections of what the implications of its spending policies are and its tax policies over the longer term, and seeing that they they don't violate solvency, you know? And um, that's, that's how you, how you create the, the discipline for these policies that maximize the welfare of the British people. And so, um, when you um, when you add it all up, uh, and, and you then apply it to this budget, this budget was, this mini budget was actually a good, a good one, in, in my opinion, and in our opinion. It, 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 it got us on the, off the starting gate with these policies. It, it reversed this really crazy rise in corporation tax and it eliminated the rise in the, 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 the cost of labor through the NICs. And it also pointed out that public services were needed and would be handled efficiently and the, the, the main objective would be to, to get them into a better state than they are, which clearly they're not in a very good state. And then Kwasi Kwarteng in his budget and, and in the treasury document that came with it, laid down his principles about solvency. And he said more or less what I've just said, you know, we, we will look at the, the projections of the debt ratio and see that it all adds up properly. And indeed, you know, we've, we've done lots of, with our model of, of, the, of the economy, um, and, 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 and uh, we, we put them, these policies into this, this model and check whether they add up. And when, well, frankly, with 2% growth, and their objective is 2.5% growth, they add up very much. And, and you get to about a 50% debt to GDP ratio by about 2035, about 10 years' time, which is just fine. And if, if, if these policies do achieve 2.5% growth, then they'll get they're much faster. Um, 
So it's, it's pretty clear to me from the arithmetic that we've done with our model that there's no problem with solvency. And the, the sort of um, the, the reactions of the markets, I think, were very ill-judged and very unsupported by evidence. Um, and you know, the, there was a reluctance on the government's part to use the Office of Budget Responsibility to do these sums in short order because with some legitimacy really because the Office of Budget Responsibility has a terrible track record in, 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 in forecasting the public sector borrowing fund. In fact, in, in March 19, uh, 2021, they forecast the public sector borrowing fund for the coming financial year at 240 billion pounds, roughly. And it came out at 140 billion pounds. So they, they over their forecast of the public sector borrowing fund by 100 billion. I mean, that is a huge margin of error. And so with that sort of reputation that they had of kind of deliberately injecting glue, I hope it's not deliberately, but actually in practice injecting glue, taking a very gloomy approach to the kind of whole fiscal scene in order to kind of create more pressure for austerity of tax rises, which I think they were, they were put in power by George Osborne um, to, to be a sort of watchdog. And you know watchdogs like to bark a lot, don't they? <laughs> so I guess that the OBR feels it should be always barking, and it certainly is barking. So <laughs> that, 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 that is the problem. Why, I think, with some justification, Liz Truss and uh, Kwasi Kwarteng were a bit reluctant to have them pontificate about their very first um, effort. But obviously, in a way, we can see that uh, without having the sort of piles of arithmetic that the OBR churns out uh, with, with you know, the, 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 so much detail in those reports, and it's very useful detail actually, that it kind of inspires people with confidence. So, not that unfortunately it should really, because the OBR has very little modeling expertise and it has very bad, doesn't have any models at all actually, it's just a gigantic arithmetic. Uh, arithmetic crunching operation with, with lots of people who are good at arithmetic and that's that's a good thing to be good at but it, you know if it's not supported by a good model of the economy it's not going to be that great and so one must hope that as we go forward the OBR kind of improves um, but clearly there's got to be something that does the arithmetic and um, Various people have since then have come up with arithmetic, most of which is fairly consistent with the quasi quartengs and the Treasury's claims that this is perfectly consistent with solvency. And I think we're going to see more of that, and the OBR, I think, will do the same. Um, so so that's, that's sort of the background to, to what we've seen in the mini-budget. We think that this mini-budget is, is consistent, I think, with, with good principles of government. And uh, I think it's <coughs> clearly consistent on our arithmetic with solvency. So we've had, a, we've had a week of total turbulence, have we not? And I don't want to go on and, and to consider what the prospects are now after this week of turbulence and after the mini-budget, because clearly, um, with, with all the turbulence, there's been uh, quite a lot of strains on um, the economy. We've seen sterling drop, of course. We've seen gilt-edged yields rise sharply. And we've seen the Bank of England issue kind of statements from its chief economist that it's going to tighten more than it has been. And it's also gone into the gilt edge markets and bought. Um, it, it's bought 85 odd billion of gilt edge bonds. So, driving up the price. I mean, the yield on gilt edge bonds, on 10 year gilt edge bonds, I think, was it 30? I forget. Anyway, dropped quite substantially by about one percentage point. I think it was on 30 year bonds, it dropped by one percentage point, which is a huge, huge change. Obviously, the market reacting to this intervention. At various levels, really. One is that 
When the Bank of England intervenes in the gilt edge market with quantitative easing like this was, it's both a market operation and a signaling operation. And the Bank of England was signaling in two ways. First of all, it was signaling through its chief economist it was going to raise rates more rapidly now. And that's a welcome thing, I think, given that it was a bit slow off the mark. The other thing it's signaling is it doesn't think rates are going to go up to the sort of levels that the market was then saying, as, even as high as 5%. And it's signaling that, uh, which I think is correct, that it won't be necessary at all to have rates go up that high. So this week has been quite significant in, term, in terms of the mini budget, as it were, waking the bank up to need to signal more clearly what it's up to. And, you know, one would have hoped, really, and, and in the future one hopes, that there's much more coordination between the Bank of England and the Treasury over these things, so that uh, everyone's sort of singing from a consistent background, you know, the sort of the same hymn sheet, as it were. But I think the week has been a useful clarification of where we are, because it's, it's clear that interest rates here will rise quite a bit more than they have done, and perhaps rather faster than they have been going up, which is a good thing. I think we need to get rates up reasonably quickly in order to get the Bank of England back on the curve, really, of responding to this high inflation. But secondly, I think as they do that, it will become more and more clear that they don't need to do too much more than something like 3%. Because one of the things that came out of last week was that if people do expect something like 6%, all hell is going to break loose in the housing market. And indeed, even the fear that that would happen has had an enormously tightening effect on monetary policy. So we've had in the past week a great tightening of monetary policy de facto, which has, I think, um, shown up in, 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 in all the markets quite substantially. So the pound, of course, has recovered. Um, because the pound was particularly responding to the differential between the Fed's high rates sort of rushing away and the bank's rather slow and stately progress. So the pound really responded to that, and that's been reversed, which I think is a good thing, because we, we, we don't really want a sort of complete pandemonium in the, in the sterling market, though we also don't want to be targeting the sterling market. Um, I'll come to that in a moment. But the other thing that I think was clarified was that rates are unlikely to go as high as those nightmare scenario rates that were getting into the market during the, during the panic. And, and I think that's good too, because um, actually monetary policy now is, is very tight already. And it's, and it's very tight worldwide. And what that's doing to inflation worldwide is bringing down commodity prices. I mean, there's a big slowdown worldwide, which we don't perhaps, we're not perhaps as much as conscious as, as, as we should be. I mean, all the big economies, and China also has is, is fallen to virtually zero growth today with its COVID zero policy and its, um, and, and its uh, real estate collapse. So the world is slowing sharply, and inflation's going to come down sharply too, because commodity prices are reversing as a result of all that. So what we're seeing is that inflation prospects are improving very sharply on the back of very tight money, both here and internationally. So that argues that all this sort of nightmare 6% interest rates on, you know, on mortgages and uh, raising mortgage rates through the roof and so forth is, is simply a nightmare. And the prospect, I think, is that rates will go up to about three fairly quickly, and then they'll peak at around that. And that, I think, has been brought forward usefully by the turbulence of last week, actually, oddly enough. So sometimes turbulence is good for you, you know, it kind of clarifies things and gets, gets sort of ducks in a row. Sometimes, you know, if the ducks are lying inside, a bit of turbulence strains them up. So this one, with what's happened, I think, in the last week in a, in a curious sort of way. And then you come to the effect of more expansionary fiscal policy and these tax cuts, and they are going to see a recession on it. And that's going to be very good news, I think, for, 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 for us all. Um, with, with growth, I think, next year, about over 2%, which will be a good start to this new environment. So inflation coming down, 
growth resuming, um, because it's pretty slow at the moment with, with all this inflation, um, very high inflation, quite low wage growth. Um, it's a very deflationary environment. But now that now the fiscal policy is becoming more sensible and more supportive, and, and these tax cuts have been injected to the system on the supply side, you've got a lot of positive things now going on that are pushing output up again. So that's, that's very helpful. And, you know, as I say, inflation's coming down. People, the, the thing is that people said this fiscal policy would, would create inflation, but it's done exactly the opposite. Because what's happened is that this great turbulence in the markets as a result of the fiscal policy has, uh, 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 has, has created these expectations of tightening in monetary policy, expectations of interest which have done, which have brought inflation down because they created more tightening and, and, and uh, through expectations. And so the fiscal policy actually has been positive for inflation, bringing it down on two counts. One is because of a supply side tax cuts and that they increase supply. And the other is because through expectations, they've enhanced the credibility of the bank, you see, because the bank now was freer to be tougher. But yet, because the bank has been forced into action, it's been able to signal that it's not going to be lunatically tough. So that's the kind of best of all possible worlds, really, for, for monetary policy and for inflation in this, in this environment. And then, um, you know, the interest rate side is good news, too, because we're going to get higher interest rates that are going to restore a normal savings market. I mean, we have this terrible, terrible period where interest rates have been zero. And the, the market for capital has been just dysfunctional, totally, giving people money for old rope, you know? And a lot of a lot, a lot of it's not very good old rope either. I and mean, we've got a lot of zombie firms that are really being propped up by the fact that it costs nothing to keep going. You just borrow the money and you know it's not costing you anything at all at afternoon. So or hardly anything. So that period of zero lower, zero lower bound, as we call it, where interest rates have been driven to zero, is now emphatically over. And that's got to be a matter of enormous celebration that we've got away from this horrible um, savings market which didn't function properly, where, where pensions were not getting proper returns and where um, people using money for, for, for business were not paying a proper price for it. And that's, that was very unhealthy. And it, it's probably one of the major reasons why we've had low productivity growth in this economy and in, and, and, and in other economies of the OECD where similar things have been going on. And so actually these new policies are already having good results, albeit assisted by quite a lot of volatility, which has been pretty uncomfortable to ride through, of course. But you know, as I say, volatility isn't always bad. It, it can wake you up, you know, it can get you sort of, you know, doing more exercise and so forth. It sort of wakes you up, and that's what's happened on this occasion. So um, <clears throat> we, we're actually not a bad place when it comes to the economic prospects. And so fiscal policy has been a useful thing to reform. Um, it's been vital to, we've got to get back Britain back on track for growth, and we've also got to get fiscal policy back on track being a useful support to the economy. Because, you know, when fiscal policy sits on its hands, um, and, and, and you know, this sort of idea of fiscal policy being supportive of the economy in recession and dampening of it in, in a boom, which has sort of gone by, by the board, really, over the last 20 odd years. Um, it's a very important component of policy because it, it helps to complement monetary policy. And uh, we've done lots of work on how much more stable the economy is when you've got both fiscal policy and monetary policy doing, their, doing what they've got to do. Fiscal policy supporting the economy uh, against the business cycle 
and monetary policy targeting inflation, but also trying to avoid hitting growth too much. And what we find is that you get much more stability when the two of them interact together <coughs> than if they don't. And there's a very good example of this, which I'll just mention briefly, which is that during, after the financial crisis, we had this period when, when we were told we had to have austerity to pay back the bailout, you know, to the banks. And so fiscal policy was, was nullified. There was no support to the economy at a time when we needed the economy desperately to recover from a financial crisis. So that, that absence of fiscal policy from the story led to the Bank of England having to be the only, only game in town. And what did they do? They printed loads and loads of money. And that drove interest rates to zero, created a huge asset bubble, and was thoroughly unhealthy in terms of the behavior of the economy. It also led to all this zombie firm and stuff I was talking about. So it was disastrous, really, that fiscal policy wasn't stepping up during that period after the financial crisis. Of course, the error was compounded by very the introduction of very tough regulation on the banks. So as fast as the Bank of England printed money, the banks refused to lend it, <laughs> which was, you know, pretty pretty disastrous all round. So. One way or another, policy really made a terrible mess of the post-financial crisis period. And uh, a lot of that mess came from the absence of fiscal policy. Because if, if government had also been helping to get the economy going, that would have meant that we, we could have avoided going to these ridiculously dysfunctional interest rates of zero. So that's it, really. That's, that's my kind of roundup of where we are. And just looking forward, finally, I think, you know, we've, we've made a good start with policy, actually. And I, I'm just hoping that the government will stay the course and not get panicked into more sort of U-turns and so on and so forth, which, of course, is the usual sort of thing that can happen when you try to change the paradigm. And most of the people who are changing it in the media don't like it at all, you know. Because the, the, the paradigm has been, you know, you give people what they want, and then you raise taxes and treat business as a milch cow to pay for it. That's been the paradigm. And it's what the paradigm on the left of our politics, isn't it? And it, it's quite a lot of that in the Tory party, too, I'm afraid. And, you know, that paradigm is transparently wrong, which is what I've been banging on about, really, for the last, uh, whatever, uh, excessive period of time, no doubt. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's really important the government sticks to its guns. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry about the 45% top rate. I mean, that's a lunatic thing to have, and it was wished on the Tory party by Gordon Brown, I think, who put it in at 50, and then the Tory, sort of willing the Tory party to go through the opprobrium of getting rid of it, you know? I mean, that's a classic sort of left-wing tactic, isn't it? You, 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 you put these things up and you know they're nonsense. I mean, Blair knew it was nonsense. Even Gordon Brown knew it was nonsense. And it, it, it of course, reduced the revenue, guaranteed to reduce the revenue. So it's a real shame that they've gone back on that one because that is a completely illogical t tax. Uh, it's damaging to, to business entrepreneurs' incentives and it's, it, it, it reduces revenue. So what, what's not to hate about it? It's, it's the most stupid tax imaginable, unfortunately. But of course, you see, it's become a totem of whether you love your neighbor. Because obviously, if you love your neighbor, you want to soak the rich. I mean, obviously, isn't it? I mean, the logic is transparently correct. <laughs> and, you know, uh, but we're actually not. I mean, it's a, it's a logic that does escape the British people, I think, generally speaking, because we're not actually a great sort of envious, egalitarian mob. We actually want people to do well, because we know if they do well, it'll be good for us. And then all we, all we do want is a decent benefit system, and that was Ms. Mrs. Thatcher recognized. I mean, she put into place the benefit system we have today, because she wanted to give benefits to people who are on low incomes, provided there were the right incentives to work. And that's that's the right way to go about it. It's nothing to do with trickle-down economics or anything. It's about, it's about 
successful economies that are growing, where some of the fruits of that growth is diverted to helping people who are less well off. And that's, that's what Mrs. Thatcher always said. Think about the Good Samaritan. What did the Good Samaritan do? He was a bloody good businessman. He made loads and loads of money, and then he gave quite a lot to the poor. And that's, that was the model she recommended, and it's surely the right model for our economy, too. So given that they've got off to a good start, and hopefully they won't go back on it, there's plenty more to do. There's a whole liberalization of the regulation agenda. We've still got the whole of the EU regulative system on our books. And uh, one of the things that Kwasi Kwarteng said is that that's going to be reviewed and um, changed over the next year and a half. And I really hope that goes ahead. That's really important. And then, you know, um, the other thing that we have to, we also have to, to, to insist goes ahead is the tax, the simplification and further movements in tax reform. I mean, our tax system is still, has still much too high marginal tax rates. And I'm not just referring to the 45% tax rate, I'm also referring to the 40% and the, the, the whole tax system, the marginal tax rate should be brought down as much as we can in the long term to create an incentive-driven uh, business environment and also worker environment too, because all these taxes on workers also have effects on labor supply. So we need to keep going with the tax reform side. There's plenty still to do. And in our report, we, we promote, proposed a sort of package of further cuts that could be brought forward and would also stimulate growth. According to our model, it has quite big effects on stimulating growth, much more than quasi Quartin quoted in his budget. But, you know, it's only a model, and of course, you know, we to see these things work on the ground. All we know is that it's in the right direction. We, the more you put in, the more you'll get out. How much that will be, of course, models can tell us, uh, give, give us a, a number, but you know, we, we, we've, got to, we've got to check it out on the ground. We do know, we do know because this model fits British experience, and British experience, of course, includes that whole Thatcher epi episode where, where, where there were big changes made in our in our economy and our tax structure and our uh, regulative structure, huge changes. And of course, it led to much faster growth. I mean, in the 1980s, which is when those changes came in, our growth was just shy of 3% a year. So that gives you an idea of how this is quantitatively pretty important. So, <coughs> so um, we need to have further tax reform, a further package, I think, whenever this can be done. We need to liberalize those regulations, those EU regulations, and approximate them to international standards so that we, at the same time as we're liberalizing, we are making ourselves open for business from the rest of the world without, by eliminating all these non-tariff barriers that these standards, these regulations create. And so that's an important agenda. So we've got the tax agenda, we've got the regulative agenda, and then we've got the trade agenda. We need to, we need to move forward fast on all these free trade agreements in order to get, to get as many countries trading with us on a free basis as possible so that we get to free trade with the rest of the world. I mean, unilateral free trade is one way to do it. And that actually, in, in many ways, it's the simplest way. And that was what happened when the, um, when the um, Corn Laws were abolished. I mean, a wonderful politician called William Huskisson was chairman of the Board of Trade in 1822, yesterday, actually, isn't it? Um, <laughs> 1822, project yourself back to then. William Huskisson in charge of the Board of Trade, trying to do trade agreements around the world, um, trying to reform the Navigation Acts, and he got some way, but he could never deal with the Corn Laws. So he never succeeded in bringing down the protection of agriculture. And in the end, in 1846, Peel, as we know, abolished the Corn Laws. Why? Because there was a famine. In the end, there was a famine crisis, you know, a cost of famine crisis, if you like, which led him to abolish the Corn Laws. And um, 
He'd been trying, effectively, Haskinson had been trying free trade agreements for, for Yonks beforehand and got pretty much nowhere. And my big fear is that, you know, we'd be too slow on this trade agreement side. And in order to get a free trade agreement bunch that's approximately equivalent to, to, the, to, the, to the bang you get from unilateral free trade, you need to do free trade agreements with all the most significant suppliers of your goods around the world. And so that's what, that's what we also need to do. So, so that's an agenda we should lose sight of because until we've got free trade with the rest of the world, we'll be continuously um, <coughs> magnetized by the EU because the EU still sets our prices because we still we have free trade with the EU. We don't have free trade with the rest of the world. So our prices are still basically set by what goes on in the EU. So we desperately need free trade, not just for its own sake in terms of boosting the economy, but also for getting our relations with the EU straight. Because until we do, the EU will always threaten us with a tariff war. And of course, while we're still in their magnetic um, circle, that tariff war can hurt us. But well, once we're out of that magnetic circle and into integrated properties to the world economy through free trade, it won't matter a rap what the EU does. It, it just is irrelevant to us because our prices will all be set at world prices. And we, anything that the EU puts on the way of tariffs will simply be passed on to their consumers. And so we need this. We need free trade, not just for its own sake, but as a bargaining chip to get rationality into all the things that, uh, all our relationships with the EU, which are they're being very troublesome, as we know, and area after area, um, constantly on anything where we we disagree with them and think they should change things, like on the Northern Ireland Protocol, they, they threaten us with these these sort of tariff wars and so forth, and of course, uh, that that is still a meaningful threat, and we need to get away from that. So, I think I've spoken enough, and I'm sorry that we still don't have anybody else to entertain you. So it's, I felt the pressure, you know, that sort of the, the only act in town got to keep going, you know. Uh, but I'm now stopped. <laughs> of law. 
uh, that is such a lot of law, it's very difficult to count it. In fact, the European Scrutiny Committee, upon which I sit, has been trying to do an exercise to establish how many laws there are. Uh, it's jolly difficult. Uh, we think that there are at least two or 3,000 pieces of, of, of law. So um, it's necessary to get rid of them. And one of the pieces of legislation that was introduced very recently was the so-called Brexit Freedoms Bill, uh, which I think uh, it's always known as the Brexit Freedoms Bill, but its, it's full title is the e Retain EU Law uh, Reform and Renewal Bill. Uh, and what that essentially will do, uh, and, and Patrick touched on this in, in his address, what that essentially will do is to ensure that by the end of next year, all retained EU law on our statute book will disappear. It'll be sunsetted <coughs> unless there is a compelling reason for retaining that law on the statute book. Um, so that's going to be a pretty major exercise for the civil service. But they are going to have to get on with it. And by the end of next year, they will feel better for having done it, and we will certainly feel better for them having done it. So that's one uh, important piece uh, of legislation that's going through. Um, the other important piece of legislation is the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill. Now, uh, that completed its passage through the Commons just before uh, the summer recess. Uh, I'm delighted to say that it completed its passage unamended. Uh, and it's now uh, gone to the House of Lords. Uh, that is going to be a bit of a challenge. But the fact is that until such time, and bear in mind that the, 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 the heading, the, the, the title of today's event is Reaping the Brexit Dividend, until such time as the Northern Ireland Protocol no longer affects the United Kingdom, we will not fully be able to reap the Brexit Dividend. Because the fact is that in Northern Ireland, uh, legislation, uh, regulations relating to goods are automatically absorbed by Northern Ireland uh, as if Northern Ireland had never left the European Union in the first place. This is having practical difficulties in Northern Ireland. We've all heard about the queues uh, of, of, of lorries trying to, trying to get through. We've all heard about the Sainsbury's lorry being turned around because the, um, the driver had a half-eaten half ham sandwich in his cab. Um, but quite apart from that, the problem is this. We can't really, and I think that Patrick will probably agree with me, we can't really change the regulatory frame, framework on mainland, in mainland GB, until, until Northern Ireland is no longer subject to EU legislation. So uh, that is, uh, I think, the other important piece of legislation that's, that's going through uh, at the moment. Um, that, but there is so much that we can do. It wasn't just all those years ago when we started this, uh, this campaign. It, it wasn't just to recover our sovereignty that we did it. We did it because we believed that there was a better way of governing ourselves that we could be far more competitive internationally without all the stultifying legislation that we're automatically subject to as a consequence of our membership uh, of the European Union. We wouldn't be subject to the precautionary principle. And I, I made the point the other day, you know, if, if, if the precautionary principle had applied at Kitty Hawk, all the Wilburite would never have got off the ground. It would never have happened. We, we just would never have started flying airplanes. To take another example, genome editing. Now, this is a wonderful scientific advance that we're pretty good at in this country. Gene editing. What we essentially do is to take the gene of an organism, usually a plant, maybe like a, 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 an animal, and we snip it. And what we effectively do over a very short, relatively short period, <coughs> is to uh, sort of replicate what would happen normally under normal selective breeding methods over many, many generations. There's nothing odd about that. You're not sort of mixing a jellyfish with a, with a banana. <coughs> it, it, it's, it, it, it's something that is quite natural, except that we're accelerating the process. But because 
subject to EU legislation, uh, we couldn't engage in gene, gene editing. That will go. This country has got tremendously talented people, very talented people, very innovative people, and they are being held back by the <coughs> continued application in this country of EU legislation. So I think that that is another thing that we need to do. We have to remember that it's not just the eco economics, and goodness knows, Professor Minford has explained uh, really to the nth degree why we are going to be so much better off when we've got uh, control of our own economic destiny. It's also a question of being in charge of our own laws and no longer subject to the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice. So we'll talk of the European Court of Justice, here comes Martin Howe Casey. We've got out. He's yeah. no longer yeah. So, uh, so uh, I, 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 there is every prospect, there's every prospect now that John Redwood may arrive. But look, um, I think you've heard enough from me. Um, I'm sure you've got questions of uh, Professor Minford. So um, if you'd like to make a start, we've got a roving mic. Um, what I will do is pass one mic on to Professor Minford. One mic will go to the questioner, and if you could please uh, identify yourself before <coughs> asking the question. <coughs> right, hello. Uh, so I'm Ethan Thelburn from the Bruges Group and also Parliament, and the, my question to you is, uh, when the Bank of England was made independent, was that a massive mistake? And how can we rectify that? And are we subject to the Bank of England being unaccountable uh, to, to nobody? Um, 
and it's clearly failed totally to do that. Um, and so there's all sorts of questions to ask about about how it goes about its business and how it exercises its instruments, and also why it made this huge mistake in permitting inflation to get so high. I mean, it did, because if you look at other central banks, like the Bank of Japan or the, the Swiss National Bank, they didn't produce, they managed to stop inflation getting much above 4%, so they had clearly, there's a big element of made, made at home in, in the inflation we had, and so it's a legitimate question to ask why. And of course, the reason is they printed an awful lot of money during the COVID period and, and kind of went a bit gangbusters over it um, and, and bought up about, I forgot the exact number now, about 35% of the whole government debt in the process. It's an extraordinary episode. And, but you know, you've also got to, when you interrogate the Bank of England about this, you've also got to ask who put them up to this? And the answer is the Treasury. <laughs> so. It's a quite a complicated business. And I think we need to be very careful about how we fool around with our institutions. I mean, I think it's legitimate to ask them about the composition of their monetary policy committee and their methods of work and how they communicate things and so forth. I think that's all, those are all legitimate questions, but I wouldn't want to abandon the Bank of England's role and instrument independence. Um, uh, but I certainly want them to answer questions about just why they went so mad over quantitative easing, which they did, and, and, and therefore stoked up the inflation we've got. And, had, and if John Redwood was here, he'd make the point that the money supply growth rate in the UK ballooned during this period, and they didn't take a blind bit of notice of it, which was clearly a very extraordinary failure. And, you know, other central banks, are the, the ones I mentioned, things and, and manage to avoid those errors. So there's clearly things that they need to be interrogated on. And I think what you mean by accountability is really being accountable for how they do things. And I think, I think that's a good idea. Thank you. There are a number of questioners. Um, I don't think I can take everybody's question um, because Professor Moonford has done quite a lot of speaking this afternoon. But I'll take a few more. But later on, you'd be delighted to hear there are some bottles of wine at the back of the room. So if you want to have a private word with him, then I'm sure you'll be uh, very welcome. Um, gentlemen there, over there. Kent Roman with the Heritage Foundation in the United States. Uh, two questions. Uh, first for Professor Minford. Can you talk a little bit about the UK's reliance or lack thereof on unskilled immigration or low-skilled immigration? and to what extent that's a problem for the UK economy going forward. And second, David, how confident are you that that civil service review will not find that absolutely every single piece of retained EU legislation is vitally necessary? I'm going to pass you. <laughs> I put my own mind on your own mind. You take that one. I'll take a look. I, I, I think that the point is this. Um, they're going to be held to account. Um, I, I did an interview the other day, and uh, I, I was asked um, what was the essence of good government. And I said the essence of good government is strong ministers working with good, strong permanent secretaries. And a strong minister, Jacob Please not, and a strong permanent secretary, whoever that may be, but I'm sure he'll make sure he's a strong permanent secretary, will ensure uh, that the officials do do that work properly. Um, I, I mean, it's going to be very hard to come up with a compelling case each and every piece of retained EU law. And that is the point. It's going to have to be a compelling case for retaining it. Otherwise, under the provisions of the bill, they're sunsetted and they disappear. So I don't think uh, that you need to have uh, any fear that there's going to be any um, chicanery on the part of the civil service because that's not the sort of thing they would ever do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then on immigration. Um, yes, well, what we have at the moment is an immigration policy that has a, um, that basically, if you satisfy um, certain skill requirements, which are defined in terms of you know, how much you earn, you, you, you basically can get a 
come and work here. And that is orientated towards our skill needs as a, as a country, and that seems to be a very sensible uh, thing to do. And one of the things that's been quite interesting is how the, it's kind of given the lie to the idea that the British just don't want immigrants, which is clearly not true, because we are a huge nation of immigrants, uh, historically, and will continue to be. So, so what about unskilled immigration? Well, one of the things that came up during the Brexit referendum was that unskilled immigration drives down the wages of unskilled workers quite sharply, and was a big focus of discontent because because, of course, EU um, citizens had a right to come here and claim all our benefits, and uh, including free, free, you know, the whole, the whole lot, education, health, everything else, and get freedom to work. And this was enormously expensive to ordinary citizens because they were paying effectively indirectly for all these health and education benefits, as well as having their wages driven down. So it became a big issue. And so um, I think that now we're, we're, we're over all that, um, the, the, there is um, a sort of question, you see, about unskilled immigration for particular things like harvesting um, or even social care uh, jobs, where there's great scarcity of workers in the current situation. I mean, there's job shortages across the labor market, but they're particularly acute, particular categories of unskilled workers. And so um, I think that it makes sense to identify these as critical shortages and to have a sort of visa arrangement whereby for example, harvesting workers are given a temporary visa to come in, do the job, and then go. You know, uh, whereas before, of course, they're just kind of blanket uh, from, from the EU. From the EU, they have this blanket ability to come and stay. So I think that's the way around this difficulty. Uh, I, I, if I can just abuse the chairman's privilege, I hope that Patrick will agree with me. I think one of the things we desperately need in this country is a comprehensive labor market because uh, on current trends, by 2030, we're going to have a shortage of about two and a half uh, million jobs, uh, at least uh, people to build those jobs in, the, in this country. And it does seem to me that one of the good things you talked about in that fiscal statement the other day was uh, the retention of capital allowance of just one million pounds, which should encourage, for example, um, people to invest more uh, in machinery, talking about um, fruit picking and vegetable picking, for example, a lot of that can be automated. And I, I, I think that that was a very good element of uh, the uh, sadly um, maligned uh, fiscal statement that was announced the other day. Gentlemen over here. Yeah, no, uh, my, yeah, my name's Hal Conti. I just graduated from the University of Warwick. I was just wondering, um, uh, all of the plans, like, or more or less, this trust's policy were, were outlined from, like, June, July, basically ever since the start of the Conservative Leadership Conference. I mean, do, do I guess, either are, like, people in the markets not paying attention, or do they just have that trust from people to keep their promises that they thought, oh, well, this isn't going to happen, then, then other, in other words, like, why didn't this uh, market volatility just start back then? Why did it all occur as if none of this had been portended prior to the fiscal statement? Well, you're, I think that's probably aimed at me. Um, I, 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 well, I, I, I think that you're absolutely right. Um, Liz said throughout a campaign, and I was involved in that campaign, that she would uh, reverse the uh, increase in national insurance contributions, and she was also repeated uh, by her on numerous occasions during the campaign. There was, however, no reference to the 45% uh, tax ban, uh, nor was there any uh, reference, I think, to bank bonuses. Well, there was like 90% of the overall. You, 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 you're absolutely right. But, um, I, I mean, you, 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 this is the problem of Sydney Smith again. Yeah, we're talking uh, from different um, That is an economic uh, 
point when you're making it's an absolutely accurate one. It, it's not a political point, however, and of course political opponents can seize upon things such as that, and they've seized on it rather effectively over the past, past few days. Um, you're quite right, there is very little, if any, logic to it, but that is precisely what's happened. It's been taken up as a political point, and it's, I'm afraid, brought damage to Two more questions. Gentlemen over there, and then I'll take the lady over here, and then the rest of you I think are going to have to. Yes, please. I'm going to have a drink later on. Uh, James Daniels, uh, first a private individual. Uh, you were talking about, uh, for instance, you were talking about uh, free trade, and what's the Northern Ireland protocol is out of the way? What would it be the economic effect if? The government declared Northern Ireland to be a free trade zone. <coughs> well, Northern Ireland, I think, as the protocol will um, emphasize, is part of the UK. So it can't be a free trade zone. Um, unless you mean, you, you mean you want to turn the whole of Northern Ireland into a sort of a beach free port? Well, I mean, it's a free enterprise. Well, you know, the investment zone no longer a zone if it applies too largely. And you know, I mean, there's an argument for making the whole of the UK an investment zone. And that's more or less what we're arguing should happen. Yes. Yes. So I think that, 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 that's where the, well, what we should focus on. We should turn the whole of the UK into an investment zone. And then essentially these other investment zones are a way of giving an advantage to disadvantaged regions. And I think they're, they're a perfectly good sort of leavening up strategy. But you know, I don't think Northern Ireland as a whole is in the category of um, a, a leavening up candidate. I would think one should be more discriminative about these investment zones. If you, But basically, I think the gist of your question gets the answer. Let's make the whole of the UK into a highly competitive zone. Yeah, but before you do that, you want to say, look, it, it can work. Here, here is an area, you'll do a trial here, it's a guinea pig, and then gives you the case to extend it. I mean, that's politics rather than economics. Catherine McBride. I'm actually a fellow for the Centre for Executive Policy as well, but I'm also one of the 
matter what they think in the Department of International Trade about what the pound should be, because the market decided on the basis of the brute facts of you know the balance of payments and monetary policy. I mean, there's two factors on the pound. One is monetary policy, and the other is you know, the longer term trend in the balance of payments. And the market is going to drive the pound to wherever we will have in the long run a balance of payments equilibrium. I mean, luckily, if we manage to make the British economy more competitive and more productive, that will drive. That will mean that we don't need to the pound to drop in order to achieve the same effect of higher competitiveness. So there's a sort of a bit of a race between uh, between the pound and competitiveness from productivity and, uh, as the kind of cure for for the big balance of payments deficit we still have on current accounts. Um, but uh, certainly the markets, uh, luckily, are in charge of that. And just the last point that you made about why is it that trade negotiators uh, sort of have a sort of vice, a, a fatal vice, which is that they don't see that the main gains for the country are from importing at a lower price from better sources of supply, which is the big effect that it has on your economy. And yeah, there's a little bit of a bonus if you can get a bit of favored entry into a foreign market because you effectively you get a higher margin on your exports than you would have done because you, you are able to enter at zero tariff maybe while everyone else is paying high tariffs and so there's a, a margin you get on your export market when you when you negotiate a, a trade deal and get <coughs> entry into the foreign market. So there is a little bit of gain on that side of things, but it's pretty small because tariffs are so low internationally these days. I mean, the, the average international tariff at the moment is 2%. So, so, you know, even getting a preference on a 2% tariff really not worth much, much at all. And so, absolutely true. The whole gains from trade, really, the vast bulk of the gains from trade, which is big in something like the huge amount of protection that the EU bequeathed to us, you know, the, the big gains we get from getting rid of that are all by just being able to import from efficient world suppliers instead of from the EU. Well, not just from the EU. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, once again, can I apologize for the fact that two, our two other speakers uh, didn't arrive, and I'm sure you're terribly disappointed, but didn't you have your money's worth from Professor Minton? Could I ask you please to show your appreciation?